Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we talk about the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna, and me, Frederick. I am super excited for today's episode with Benedict and Ben. We're going to be talking about Findora and all of the work that they've been doing on that project. But before we start in on this, I want to just give a quick aside. Um, I want to check in with Frederick, who's here today. Frederick has not been on the show for about like three weeks. And I, I feel like our audience is probably very curious as to what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good mix of stuff. A mix of work and life, I'd say. <laughs> but obviously a lot of work. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we kicked off the Polkadot launch process, uh, which is a big thing and um, takes a lot of uh, coordination effort. Uh, it's a very long, elaborate process, uh, which is interesting, but it's all, all green light so far. It's going pretty well. And you know, we, we are very cautious in how we roll this out and we want everything to sort of go well, <laughs> for, mm. for lack of a better <laughs> definition. Uh, but, you know, it, we started super conservatively, like it's a proof of authority network, just making sure that the consensus algorithm doesn't have fundamental bugs, that there's liveness on the chain, etc. Then uh, open it up to a, a broad nominator, validator set uh, with people being able to nominate, et cetera. Scaled that up to 200 validators, that's running perfectly fine. So that's all, you know, green lights, really good. Good engagement from the community and, and people who are trying to do stuff on the network so far. Uh, next step is uh, enabling governance and removing this uh, pseudo module that can sort of, it's, it's the last bit of fail safe mechanism that we have. <laughs> uh, and uh, beyond that, you know, it's, it's decentralized. Cool. So that's, uh, that's a cool thing. That's And this is a project. This is a long, uh, it's been a long road. Yeah. I mean, the project itself is three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's but, definitely uh, an exciting yeah. time. Just the launch project <laughs> is a long road. <laughs> but uh, cool. yeah, no, it's good. It's good. I mean, we get to now kick off and start the real work of, of trying to build a community and trying to build out actually useful things, things that you can do with this. <laughs> Just totally. having the infrastructure doesn't actually do much unless you can do something on top of that infrastructure. So yeah, starting to look at the use cases, which is which is fun. I'm super curious now that Polkadot's out there or almost fully out there. Um, I'm really curious to see how zero knowledge proofs and the privacy concepts that we've been talking about on this podcast make their way into it. Yeah. And I'm going to hopefully help a little bit with the ZK validator that is a validator working on validating on Polkadot. So yeah, it's going to be interesting because we might even see a little bit more blending from this podcast of those two projects as time goes on. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I, I think uh, and it, uh, maybe it's something that listeners don't really know or or have insight into is like this for me is not a work project, right? Like this is something that I do outside of work. So that's maybe why it's also strange for people to like, how can he be busy with work? Like this probably <laughs> isn't this work, but no, like to me, it's not. To me, this is something else. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're back for this episode and I think we'll continue over the summer to have you on, but maybe we're gonna also continue to have a few guest hosts so that you can focus on getting this out fully. I did wanna let the audience know that our friend Alexandra had suggested doing an AMA with us in the near future. So this would be something like asking questions from you, our listeners, that maybe we can do a bit of research on and answer. So if you're interested in that, you should head over to a brand new subreddit that I just created and has very few followers, ZK Podcast, uh, very few subscribers. But I think over there is where we're going to be collecting the questions, and I'll definitely be pinging you all over the next few weeks about that. So... Yeah, hopefully we get to hear a little bit more from you. All right. Now, I think we should move on to today's episode. Thank you, Benedict and Ben, for patiently listening through this intro. <laughs> Welcome to the show again to both of you, actually. Thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah, thanks for having us. Cool. So, Benedict, you were on the show, I think, almost two years ago. 
talking about bulletproofs. I don't know if you remember that day. It was 38 degrees. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it was incredibly hot in Berlin. And we were all in a studio talking about yeah, bulletproofs. <laughs> oh my God. Was, uh, <laughs> when I didn't, I definitely- Simpler, simpler times, you know, like uh, <laughs> the world was still mostly whole and uh, <laughs> together, but um, no, I, I very much uh, remember that. That was cool. But uh, there's been a long time since then. And Ben, you were on last year. And for that episode, we actually talked about accumulators. So a very specific topic. I kind of want to put the question, I mean, in each of those episodes, you did introduce yourselves and gave a little bit about your backgrounds. We'll put the links to those in the show notes if anyone wants to hear more about, you know, what we had talked about before. But I think maybe as a kickoff here, what have you been up to since then? What's new? Maybe let's start with Benedict because it's been longer for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's been a lot of things that have been new. I've been, been working with uh, Ben and being productive and putting out some new uh, cryptography tools. And um, so part of that is uh, we developed a, a new kind of zero knowledge proof uh, called uh, Supersonic, or which uses kind of this tool called Darks. Um, that one of the key upsides of that is that it's a, it's a zero knowledge proof again that doesn't have a trusted setup like Bulletproofs, but also has kind of features like Snark where snarks where the verification is is much much faster than uh you know the the size of the thing that you're actually trying to prove so this has been work with uh, ben and alan chepeniak so that's been very exciting and then um you know we've had some other works you know for example uh, recently there there sean and others have put out this this uh, amazing work of halo so i've been working with a uh, Alessandra Chiesa and uh, Pratush and, and Nick Spooner and, uh, from Berkeley and we've been working on kind of formalizing that and generalizing the approach that they have there which is a really genius insight and trying to generalize this to, to more tools and um, so that's been taking up some of my time and then obviously you know the what we're going to talk about today kind of the work on Findora. That's amazing I mean it sounds like so much of your work Pretty much everyone you just listed has been on the podcast in the last like eight months <laughs> or on the study club. I mean, it's just so it's so cool to hear that connection point too. like for you guys from the Stanford group to kind of like also be working on the stuff with the ECC and the people at Berkeley. This just sounds really neat. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, I think it, it also speaks to the, the high quality of, of your podcast, right? Like, I think you just have really a really broad and, and cool set of guests and you know it's 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 an honor to be working with some of them and also you know there's a lot of like even if you don't work directly with them you know the community feeds off each other right someone does an improvement in in, in one area and then other people get to use it and uh, build something new with it by plugging new things together so that's one of the great things about the academic community in general and i think especially in the, the cryptography community they we're doing a pretty decent job at like collaborating, taking other people's ideas, improving them. And uh, yeah, so that's why kind of everybody knows each other. And like, I think podcasts like yours are really important for this, for, for you know, spreading the ideas and, and getting people to know, getting, you know, these ideas out there. And, and yeah, so I think that's really important. Something we've said on on several episodes in the recent past is how, like, if you even look back like six months or a year, it's it's crazy how much has happened. For you who's like knee deep into everything, does it feel like that to you as well? If you look back, just like the crazy speed that things are moving, or is this normal? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I certainly think so, you know, um, and I think that's, you know, part of it is it's just more smart people from different areas getting involved, like, you know, not just academics, more practitioners sort of, you know, and also as things get deployed, new issues arise. And so which open new interesting questions, which then lead to new interesting answers, right? Before, you know, if things are mostly theoretical and never actually deployed, then you know, everything seems to work fine. But then once you actually try to, to deploy them, then you realize, oh, okay, this this kind of small thing that we didn't even think about is actually now a huge thing. And we need to come up with sort of a 
whole completely different new plan to to resolve this and this then maybe leads or ideally leads to a new wave of innovation so i think you know all of these things are definitely correlated and connected you know the increased application of these tools leads to increased attention leads to increased new development of them leads to increased application so it's right now uh, you know and let's hope this continues we're sort of in a positively reinforcing kind of cycle i think cool what about you ben what have you been up to well since i've last been on the show um many many things um of course, Findora, we've ramped up significantly, probably since we last talked on this show. Uh, we have a team of um, already 15 engineers, and we're heading towards a launch of our, our test net. So that's um, been taking up a lot of my focus as CTO. And of course, uh, I've been continuing my research, mostly focusing on authenticated data structures and zero knowledge proofs. As uh, Benedict mentioned last summer, we, we released a paper on uh, supersonic or dark, which is a major development in trustless zero knowledge proofs. And we've been continuing to improve that uh, since we released that paper. Um, in addition, I've been working on other uh, general techniques and improvements to polynomial commitment schemes, which is a major tool that underlies many of the modern constructions of uh, zero knowledge um, and verifiable computation systems. I wonder, did you did you ever see the like Justin Drake's kind of breakdown of polynomial commitments? Did you ever get a chance to catch that? There have been a number. I don't know if I remember seeing Justin's uh, specifically. It was a study club. It's on YouTube, but. It's becoming, as I understand it, it's just becoming more formalized. Like that entire space is like they're starting to see like it's broken down into into basically more comprehensible structures or something. Yeah. Like well, one depictions maybe. Right. Well, one thing that we tried to make clear in our paper on supersonic was a holistic overview of the systems that use polynomial commitments to break it into. Um, to separate it into, into modular components. So there's an information theoretic component, as it's called, and then there's a polynomial commitment compiler, and you can mix and match these things. So many of the systems you've heard of, Marlin, Sonic, um, Planck, Starks, etc., they all have a underlying you know, information theoretic backbone that can then be compiled with any polynomial commitment scheme and and that gives you many different combinations of of constructions that have uh, that inherit the properties of each cool you're both phd students at stanford in dan bonet's group still right that's right how long are you like it's awesome but like are you are you graduating soon i'm just kind of wondering how long i get to call you part of dan bonet's research group to be determined <laughs> Is it so good that you don't want to leave? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> that That's not an inaccurate statement. <laughs> I mean, that's certainly part of it, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's an, it's, we have an amazing group. No, I think we have a, we have an, we have an amazing group and, and there's uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, Dan obviously is amazing, but there's also, you know, a, a, a lot of other great students in, in that group and it's, um, it's a cool uh, scene to be around, and uh, you know I think um, both uh, Ben and I are enjoying it. And you know, at some point, you know, I think both of us uh, want to finish, but um, it's no uh, rush, basically. Yeah, not <laughs> necessarily uh, a time pressure, and uh, no, no, no rush. Yeah, I mean, it's I think if you if you enjoy what you're doing and and you get you're still productive, then. You don't necessarily have to rush it. It's a very good environment to be in, and um, there's a lot of interaction and collaboration with with outside entities. Um, and while Benedict and I were part of the group, we also founded Fendora. So, as Benedict said, we'll see about the future, but it, it's a comfortable place to be. <laughs> I'm curious. Every time we sort of check in with the group <laughs> in general, like anyone from the group or see stuff there there's always something new i'm curious about in general in dan's research group like what are the major topics that are being researched essentially 
I think everyone's working on something slightly different. Dan's group covers many topics. Uh, Benedict and I work on zero knowledge proof systems and um, authenticated data structures for the most part, as well as systems that are related to those cryptographic tools. Other people in the group also work on on on, on similar topics, but but others work on things um, like uh, adversarial machine learning. Uh, Florian works on that. Um, some people work on private information retrieval. Some people work on, you know, post-quantum signatures from isogenies on elliptic curves. People work on diverse topics. Hmm. Who's doing the isogeny stuff? Dima. Dima Kogan, a very excellent, uh, you know, PhD student. I think, you know, like yeah. things are closely tied together. I think it's a good moment to actually dig into Fendora. One of the reasons that I reached out to you, Ben, just recently was that somebody had actually asked us to do an episode on Findor to find out a little bit more about what this project really is. I think maybe as a starting point, where does Findora come from? Did you found it? Was it a project that existed before you joined? Where did it start? No, I founded it. And of course, it's difficult to trace the true genesis of any company or project, but uh, we formally founded the project and I was the first technical member uh, back in uh, summer of 2018. Who, who were the other founders? Who, who, who is the group? So I started it after uh, meeting uh, two people in particular. Um, one was Lily Chow, who was um, a, a co-founder, but also our seed investor. And John Powers, who is the former CEO of Stanford Management Company. Um, he used to manage the Stanford Endowment, um, in fact, during the recession. And uh, Tough job. <laughs> he did a good job of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, shortly after, brought in Benedict and Charles Liu. Uh, Charles was a PhD student, actually, in Dan's group, but um, left to uh, take the full-time role of CEO at Fundora. Uh, ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, part of the initial momentum and, and kind of the driving idea of Fundora was that, you know, there were we had uh, really you know someone like John and Lily. These are experts in, in finance and deep in the world of finance, and they just saw problems or, or, or challenges in, in in the world of, of finance. And Ben and uh, he brought us in, uh, kind of had the, the expertise to see, you know, how blockchain ledger tools, zero knowledge proofs could sort of address some of these key, key issues in the world of finance with, uh, you know, very smart and, and advanced technologies and kind of this, this uh, match of, of a problem and a solution, like a, a, a real world problem and a technical solution is kind of the, the founding spark, I would say, of Fendora and, and kind of still the driving motivation of it. Cool. I, my next question was actually going to be around that that topic of was the company founded? So maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but there's something that is a Fendora Ledger, which we'll get to. But was the company founded with that mission from the start, like we're going to build a blockchain? Or was it founded from, you know, we have these problems that we know exist in finance and we want to find some solution, but you weren't married to the idea of this ledger. So thanks for the question. I think the founding um, of, of, of the company was really about bringing together people with diverse experiences, um, both on, you know, the problem space in finance and on cryptography and blockchain related technologies. I don't think that when we started out, we had in mind, we're specifically going to build a blockchain or we're going to solve exactly this problem in finance. You know, I, I've recognized that the, the technology does have, does have um, uh, can be transformative for the financial space and financial technology in general is, uh, is due for makeover in many ways. And I know that, that, you know, good projects come out of collaboration of people with diverse experiences and knowledge that they can bring to the game. Hmm. Like, I think we should probably like find out what is Fendora? What is Fendora today? Is it a blockchain? A, like, is it a software company? What, what is it? Right. Well, it's a little bit of both. So yeah. we do have a, a technology development company and we also have a Fendora foundation. The technology development company 
is developing a software system. It's a multi-purpose transactional system that does um, use many of the same underlying elements of blockchain. So you could call it a, a blockchain system or blockchain-based system. It's multi-purpose. It, it can be, be used for issuing assets of any nature, in, including cryptocurrency. So it, it can be used as the as the backbone for a cryptocurrency or any digital asset system. You know, it can be deployed in a variety of operational configurations with different types of consensus protocols. There's no one size fits all solution for every use case. Therefore, we um, from the, from the get go, we're aiming to make things flexible. And our main focus and product differentiation is privacy, which is something that we are experts on, and um, and and we thought that you know we could build a, a blockchain backbone system that just does the integration of privacy and transparency very well. So it has all the same properties of you know public accessibility and auditability of of other blockchain-based transactional systems, but also retains privacy to the greatest extent. Is Fendora a protocol though? Like, is it a is it a protocol or is it a software or is it a company? Fendora Foundation is going to operate a deployment of the Fendora system, and it will be just like other public services like Ethereum or Bitcoin or other blockchains. The technology development company, however, is is developing the underlying system that will be used and run by the Fendora Foundation as a public service but is also applying it to other problems as well. For example, we have a partnership with Tencent Cloud and we plan to run a version of the system inside Tencent Cloud for different use cases than one might use the public ledger for. And, and to your question of whether it's a software or a protocol, so sort of very similar, I think, to, to other things, you know, like uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin, right? It's a book, right? You know, like every, I think the software kind of defines a, a protocol. So there's a, in, in that way, yes, it's both. A protocol can define. <laughs> or a protocol. Yeah. No, yeah. I think this distinction. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think, could, yeah, I I think actually like. Software is running the same I think, yeah. I think this distinction between softwares and protocols has only become a discussion in the, in the, in the blockchain space, which is a, which is an interesting space, but I think, you know, classically software companies have protocols involved in their systems. So I would say it's a system and um, we're going to, the foundation is going to run this system as a public service, but we may use it for other purposes too. And I, I think the, the distinction becomes important when there are multiple implementations, right? I mean, Parity's history is an example of where, where we did not define a protocol, right. but we did define a software. Right. And, um, I mean, uh, taking an example outside of blockchain space, like SSL is a protocol. Right. You can't say like, there's this company that makes this piece, piece of software and that's SSL. Right, that's a good point. Um, yeah. But I think in these cases, like, I think we see, I'm Polkadot is still the same today, right? Where it's both the software and the protocol. I mean, that there aren't multiple implementations, so it's not that useful to right. talk about distinguishing. And I guess usually that's how things start out and then maybe later on, uh, you know, multiple implementations. But I think, you know, I want to highlight one thing that, that Ben said, um, sort of as the key differentiator, it's, uh, he was saying, you know, it's, it's this focus on privacy and, and it's, it's important that, you know, uh, there's other protocols like uh, Zcash or Monero that are focused on privacy. But I think one key differentiator is that we want to have, as Ben was saying, kind of both the privacy and the transparency so that you can still, you know, even though you have uh, a certain level of privacy, you can still make sure uh, that, for example, you know, this token, you know, say there's a token running on the platform and you can say, this can only be transferred between citizens of the European Union. And, uh, you know, the rule, the, the, the ledger can enforce these kinds of rules, much more complicated rules, where, you know, you have kind of selective disclosure only you know very selective information only the the minimal information is revealed and everything else remains private so it's really a more nuanced and balanced approach to privacy where you can exactly choose how much you need want to and need to reveal mm -hmm. 
That's actually, that selective disclosure concept, which I did learn from you, Ben, <laughs> like, I guess last year when you were talking about Fendora and what it was doing, I've, I've mentioned it a bunch of times on the podcast, this, this idea that like using zero knowledge proof systems, potentially along with other systems, you have this ability to reveal certain information and keep other maybe sensitive information private. Yeah. So I, I think, right. Like people would think have sometimes almost the misconception, you know, when, when, when you think about privacy, you think about, you know, wanting to hide uh, everything about you and, and, you know, you're um, some political dissident that has, you know, some very good motivations for trying to be as anonymous and as private as you possibly want to be. But, you know, I think it's, it's important to realize that in uh, for a lot of use cases uh this is not exactly what you want or you know say uh, a very simple example that i love to give is that you know one company paying its suppliers may be okay with publicly revealing who their suppliers are uh, or not maybe they want to hide that as well and um, but they definitely wouldn't be okay with you know showing to their competitors you know what price they're paying their suppliers for uh, you know, whatever good they're getting. So you want to definitely hide, you know, the amounts that you're paying. Or for example, you know, my uh, my salary, I might want to, you know, not have that be public on the blockchain while I'm okay with, you know, people knowing who I'm getting my salary from. Or potentially the tax authorities being able to or the tax properly authorities, assess right, it. Yeah. So, yeah, and you want, you know, and companies want to follow regulations and rules, right? And and they want, you know, maybe a regulator to be able to exactly, as you say, like a tax authority to see that, yes, I've paid the right amount of taxes, but they still don't, you know, want some level of uh, privacy towards the outside world. So I think this, in the real world, you know, we, we really, in sort of the real world, uh, we really have a, a need for often more nuanced levels of, of privacy. And this is part of the thing that we're trying to address is, is to be able to enable people to have these, you know, like uh, use these nuanced levels of, of privacy and this selective disclosure. But it is that you're, let's, let's take the example of only being able to transfer within EU. You're disclosing that you know, I am a EU citizen <laughs> and that's then public to the world. It's not that there is like a zero knowledge circuit that guarantees that only these types of transfers can happen. Actually not. So uh, the way that it works in Fendora is the issuer of an asset that can only be transferred within the EU would place a policy on the asset that can be confidential. And that p puts the guarantee that the, the users who are authorized to, uh, to transact with that asset um, have to have EU credentials, but that's not visible publicly to the, to the rest of the system. That's cool. And it, it sounds, I actually want to dig into this, to, to like the client and the structure here a little bit. I mean, this sounds like something akin to smart contracts. Would you say that Fendora has smart contracts? Yes, uh, we do have smart contracts. Um, placing policies on assets is a basic kind of example of a smart contract. And uh, we, we tend to focus on, on policies on assets. Um, but we do have other uh, you know, types of self-executing contracts that look more like... Um, what you would normally associate with Ethereum smart contracts. So is there like um, a virtual machine that, that ships with Endora of some kind, or is this, are these contracts that you sort of build into the client or into the runtime in some way? Uh, you know, we do have a domain specific language. Um, so you could say that you can, you can view the Fendora system as a certain version of a virtual machine, but, uh, it's not running a language like Solidity. Um, we have our own uh, domain-specific language for, for writing uh, policies and, um, and setting up contracts that uh, is built for predictability and static analysis. So it's not as uh, comprehensive as Solidity, but we think it covers most of the functionality you would want. What's it, what's it similar to? Are there any existing projects that you would put kind of in a similar category in terms of what like the actual, like how it operates under the hood? I would say so. I mean, I would say that um, we overlap with 
projects that have built in zero knowledge on top of Ethereum, right? There are Ethereum smart contracts that run zero knowledge proofs. Uh, I know of a project called uh, Dusk that started around a similar time as, as we did, and they seem to be doing something similar, which I'm not surprised about. I think that, you know, this is a, an exciting uh, application space. And so it's um, natural that there will be multiple projects working on similar things and, and we'll see where that goes. Can Fendora be used with existing blockchains? So it's not built to be used with existing blockchains. It's also not really clear how to specify what we mean by an existing blockchain. The, the, the best way probably would be to, to look at the, the consensus protocol, which is the operational system. So if, you know, if there's an existing network that is running a consensus protocol, uh, that could be adapted to Fedora's you know, consensus protocol interface, then they could, in theory, run, you know, the, the Fedora systems, so they could run the Fedora validators using the existing consensus protocol. I guess I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if it can interoperate or if it is like if it could sit on top like a layer two or if it could. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of one of these like kind of interoperable systems like Polkadot or Cosmos. So, so first of all, I, I think with a system like Polkadot, uh, since Polkadot is written in a more modular um, way, also a system like Tendermint, you know, there's a consensus protocol that is in, in intentionally written to be interoperable with other systems. So, so we could definitely, in fact, we already have a, a version of our uh, system that is compatible with the Tendermint consensus protocol. And we could likely make one that's compatible with Polkadot. Interoperability comes from systems speaking the, the same language. So usually you have to put some effort into um, hooking the two systems together. And it's, and it's a matter of how easy that process is. Mm. But I mean, I think if the very concrete question if you know, if, is, is Fedora an Ethereum smart contract? No, it is not. And you know, one of the, we, we sometimes get asked, like, you know, why didn't you try to build the system as, say, an Ethereum smart contract? And part of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a multi-layered answer, but part of the answer is that, you know, there's been a lot of work in, in making zero knowledge proofs uh, more and more performant. But, you know, we really want to, you know, we want to be able to handle real world systems and we want to be able to handle many, many transactions. And I think to really squeeze out sort of the, the latest, uh, you know, optimizations and have the most flexibility in our system, it's just um, a lot more feasible to, to do that as kind of more of a base layer uh, protocol instead of trying to work within the constraints of, of, you know, say the Ethereum virtual machine and especially the resource, con resource constraints there. I'm curious though, like you, the the contracts is some sort of DSL. I wonder if it's an embedded DSL, and I'm curious how that DSL translates to machine code, because I like give me the the run through of how that works. So it probably would be best if you want to know the the, the guts of the DSL to talk to um, to talk to Joe from our team, who's the main guy who's been working on the DSL. Um, I oversee his work, but Benedict and I are not uh, programming language experts. We work more on cryptography. Um, but at you know, at the highest level, the I mean, Fedora ships with the DSL and also basically the the, the DSL interpreter. Um, so that's that's embedded in the system. We're not uh, compiling to machine code. Um, the one thing that we do want to do is, is um, and this was one of the design goals of the DSL, is to be able to compile to circuits. Yeah. Uh, that's what allows us to take uh, DSL policies and make them confidential um, in combination with our, um, you know, zero knowledge uh, compilers. Yeah, it makes sense. It's almost a DSL for writing circuits rather than... That's right traditional smart contracts and then you have some interpreter that that takes that dsl and, and uh that's right executes the circuits right well yeah so i guess in some ways the pipeline is dsl to circuits to then zero knowledge proof system yeah makes sense and what like you you mentioned there's pluggable consensus which is interesting and i want to get back to a point on that and then you you have the foundation operating some some public network what consensus algorithm does the public network operate on? 
So our, our test net is running on Tendermint consensus and the public network, which we haven't released yet, uh, we're still um, juggling decisions there. So there's no formal decision that, uh, that we've you know, announced in terms of exactly the consensus protocol that will, that will run. Um, I think it's a, right. it's a difficult decision um, to make in general, but so we're, we're trying to handle all the constraints and, and make a, an informed decision. And I mean, I think that like, you know, we've talked in the beginning about the, the sort of the improvements in kind of the zero knowledge space. I think that very similarly in the consensus space has been, yeah, a similar kind of circle of, of improvements and, and, and new developments where People really now look at, at problems that come up in practice when trying to deploy these consensus protocols and, and come up with exciting news, new ideas. So um, this is something that we're closely monitoring. In our white paper, which we, um, re which we, which we released last year, our updated white paper, we do discuss um, in depth our uh, thoughts and perspectives and uh, where we are in terms of you know, the, the current options we're considering in terms of consensus. And that takes a blend of techniques, also suggests some minor modifications, um, but we're not, we have not committed to a, a specific consensus protocol yet. The thing I wanted to get back to on, on the topic of pluggable consensus is from the idea of, of uh, having privacy or zero knowledge proofs or some sort of, you know, from this initial spawn of idea to having a blockchain client with pluggable consensus and networking and all the other shit that needs to happen is a very long step. Right. Um, why did you go down that path? I, I think it's an admirable path to go down, but you know, you look around the space and so many projects are like, oh, we're, we just forked Bitcoin or we forked Ethereum or we did this thing and that thing to like shortcut the route. It writes off a lot of uh, potential applications um, when you do that. And some of the applications we were you know, thinking about from the very beginning, uh, really don't require a consensus at all. So yeah. two in particular would be a cloud operating an instance of the Fedora system, which would allow for confidential transaction processing in the cloud. So banks have been starting a transition from their legacy systems to the cloud for a while. And one of the primary concerns is security and compliance, you know, famously Capital One was running their transaction system in, in AWS and, uh, and got hacked. Now, of course, we, you know, d debate the details of, of whether it was AWS fault or their fault. But the simple reality is that if you don't keep data in the cloud, then there's less risk of if the cloud is hacked, then the data will leak because it's not storing data in the first place. So that's part of our reason of partnering with Tencent is to offer this service to banks to, to do transaction processing on their behalf without receiving their data. Another example would be to take traditional payment services, digital payments like WeChat, um, and also another reason for partnering with Tencent and Venmo and PayPal, which are not running consensus protocols, but are also not handling data confidentially. And uh, one of the one potential barrier for international adoption of WeChat is the fear that, you know, they could give their data to the Chinese government or, or do something else with it. And uh, if these services would use Fendora system as, a, as or integrated into their transaction processing, then they could offer confidential accounts to their customers. So those are two examples that have nothing to do with consensus, which is why we didn't decide to just fork Bitcoin and um, you know put out another very blockchain specific uh, you know decentralized system. Fedora Foundation is is doing that and will pick a particular consensus protocol, not not Nakamoto consensus, um, but the the idea of that is to be a public service like other uh, bl blockchain systems. And one of the value propositions is that if we get a lot of um, other enterprises or businesses using the Fendora software system in other um, application scenarios, then those will m much more easily be interoperable with the uh, public service that Fendora Foundation runs. I think, you know, this is the one of the, I guess, maybe key realizations or, or key advantages is that, you know, the, the same kind of transaction technology that is 
useful for you know a very close system or you know a system where you have one like kind of basically used as a database can then also be used as a, you know a very open system you know that like kind of a, a permissionless system and uh, that's one of the you know that was one of our huge motivations for for kind of a, a trying to make the consensus as modular as possible because we're, we're envisioning very different use cases. But it turns out even though these use cases are so different, like the underlying transaction system is kind of the same, right? It's really, you know, pluggable consensus really means we're, we're looking at these things modularly. There's the consensus part and then there's the transaction part. And ideally you can swap them, take one, you know, of each or, or swap, put them together in different combinations. That makes me think of uh, what you really mean was pluggable consensus, because it sounds almost like it's not just pluggable consensus, but pluggable networking and pluggable transaction pooling, pluggable a bunch of other things that are sort of normally key to like a, a public blockchain, and that you consider the Fendora system to almost just be the transaction processing system. Like the, if we've considered it a black box, that Fendora is. You know, the input is a transaction and the output is like the modified state. Well, that's certainly the, the differentiating piece of software that we've worked on. But I don't think this is such a different, it may be a different trend than what's in the, the blockchain space, but I don't think it's so different from the way the software industry has worked where, you know, a company would develop a new type of database system um, and still run a fault tolerance, maybe Paxos or something else, um, but they would build their differentiating product, which is some kind of nuanced transaction processing system, and then use standard solutions for the networking and the and the consensus. I, I don't think it's, uh, well, it, it, it's to some degree uncommon in the blockchain space, but not entirely. That's exactly right. how we built right. something. <laughs> no, you, you, <laughs> we, you we wanted to separate right. out these two, two fundamentally different aspects where the transaction processing, what we call our runtime, is one aspect and the other aspect is like the low level networking and things that you should, really shouldn't have to care about. Right. Um, but, but it brings me back to this very large step of like building a whole blockchain is a lot of stuff. How do you do that with 15 people? Like it's a very tall order for 15 people to build all of this. Well, uh, we didn't even start with 15 people. We started with, with fewer than 15 people and we've grown. So as, as you know, with a startup, it's a process. Um, you know, it takes time to grow the team. It takes time to be able to um, handle the large scope of a project like this. Um, but we're progressing. And, and so um, what we're going to release in, in August is a test net that just runs on the Tenderman consensus protocol and, you know, does a, a subset of, of, of what we may do in the future. But what we have can at least already be used for, you know, many of the applications that, that do not require a, a different consensus protocol than the one that we can support already. That's still cool. It's still, uh, an achievement to do that much with that few yeah and i mean part of the answer is you know you have uh, 15 amazing people you know who are really good at their jobs so that really helps i want to go back to the supersonic work that you mentioned earlier because you said that that was somehow related to the work you do at fendora and i'm just curious like where does that live in what you've described, because most of what we've just described is sort of like conceptually what Fendora solves for businesses, right. and then a little bit more about like the structure of the blockchain. But yeah, where's the supersonic work? Right, that's a great question. So the part of what we do, you know, or you know, we said that we are achieving kind of this this balance between privacy and transparency, and maybe you know, maybe to to listeners of this podcast is maybe obvious, but you know, one of the key tools that you use for that is zero knowledge proof, right? Instead of saying, here are the details of the transactions, you know, and you can yourself, like in Bitcoin, you see uh, input addresses, input or in Ethereum, you see, you know, like the inputs to the smart contract, and then you can run the contract and see whether it uh, outputs yes is okay, or whether it throws an exception. In our system, you know, you would give a zero knowledge proof, the, the sender of the transaction creates a zero knowledge proof, and attaches that to the transaction. Mm. And we're using different tools for different kind of zero knowledge proofs. So for the simplest transactions, uh, you know, you can use 
something like bulletproofs where you want to just say hey um you know this very simple transfer of an asset is is, is valid you know then maybe a bulletproof is good enough but bulletproof has one key downside is that if the kind of thing the statement that you're trying to prove gets too complicated then checking the proof gets quite expensive right so verifying that the proof is, is valid is gets more and more expensive the the more and more complex mm. the transaction is so for high complexity transactions we need kind of a snark um and ideally you know we would uh sort of not have a trusted setup and so that's where something like supersonic comes in um which is a snark without a trusted setup which we can use to kind of prove these much more complicated transactions mm -hmm. you know something that comes out of our domain specific language right that's what we talked about before is you know someone creates a complicated set of rules that need to be um checked in order to verify the transactions um and this gets then compiled into the circuit and once the circuit is, is is very large then you know it makes sense to use a different kind of zero knowledge proof so one you know example is say someone wants to have kind of a an anonymous transaction where like a little bit more zcash style where they don't reveal you know who exactly they are then it it seems like uh, sort of that reaches the limits of bulletproofs and you would want to use a different kind of tool mm. i like it's interesting because just for like the previous episode that I just did, we actually were talking about Starks. Um, mm -hmm. And that was actually the argument that I understood from there as well, which is like when it's a very complicated, if there's a lot of complicated rules underlying something, in their case, a Stark might be, one Stark, even though it's bigger and slower, might be simpler than many, many Snarks that you would need to use. Right, and, and I mean, I think, you know, that, that's even, you know, there's there's kind of different thresholds. Um, you know, maybe a, a, a Stark might be good in a setting where you want to prove that, you know, an entire block in in the blockchain is valid. You know, or a set of transactions. You know, sort of for transaction aggregation, uh, that you know, a set of transactions is valid. So there's kind of you know, there's there's very there's different levels in complexity. There's like simple transaction, complex transaction, many many complex transactions. And based on the different setting, you know, I think it makes sense to use different tools mm. for, you know, it is not, I don't think we're at a state yet where we have one tool that, you know, is the best in all settings. And, and, you know, I mean, I think this is part of the reason why we have, uh, you know, a fairly high density of, of, of cryptography expertise in, in our team is because, you know, um, we need kind of this expertise to decide which tools to use, you know, in, in what case. We also use other tools that can be viewed as special cases of zero knowledge, but they're not the generic zero knowledge proof systems like Bulletproof, Supersonic, Starks, Planck, etc. that people talk about. So anonymous credential techniques, Sigma protocols, techniques from classical cryptography literature, that are more appropriate for specific things um, and you wouldn't just throw a powerful generic proof system at. So the anonymous credentials that Ben just mentioned, that's kind of this this EU example, for example, that would be, you know, where uh, I want to prove to you that I'm, you know, I have the credential to, to you know, do this transaction or I'm a EU citizen you know, that would work with this tool, you know, this cryptographic tool called anonymous credentials. So you have someone issuing you a credential, like some password authority, some, you know, sort of outside authority, you know, checking your password and saying like, hey, you're a citizen of, of uh, Poland. And uh, then you can prove like, hey, I'm within the list of the EU countries. And that's why I can receive this asset or something along those lines. I just want to kind of go back to what we talked about earlier. Like, do you have like a, you have a language, you have a domain specific language. Is that what you yeah. called it? And like, so you're writing, like you basically have designed these systems. We've seen the white papers. We've seen like, you've like mathematically outlined how these different kinds of snark or supersonic or these kind of different, these different kinds of zero knowledge proof systems work. And then you implement them using the domain specific language but I don't exactly understand where they live. 
And I'm sorry if I'm no. so, <laughs> sort of I'm dumb really that way. But... <laughs> so we, we don't implement our system using the domain-specific language. The domain-specific language is akin to Solidity. It's something that a user would use to write a policy on an asset or write uh. a smart contract that the system understands. Um, we've implemented the, the backbone of the system in Rust. And where the zero knowledge proofs live, well, the validators or the servers that are doing the transaction processing need to be able to run the verification algorithm of the zero knowledge proofs. And the clients who submit transactions need to run the prover algorithm to create a proof that becomes attached to the transaction. They may use the domain specific language to write a policy in a common understandable language that then gets compiled to a, a, um, a circuit and then further com uh, you know, compiled into a zero knowledge proof of a statement. I, I think I understand what you mean, but in that case, like this, like each of these, I'm just trying to understand how how one of these, I guess, contracts would interface with these different kinds of of systems that you have, like the the different kinds of zero knowledge proof systems. Are they all already there? They can just tap into them. Mm, so the validator of the system runs specific zero knowledge proof uh, systems for the ones that we've chosen to use for specific types of transactions. So take, for example, basic confidential transfers. Um, the validators would be running a bulletproof verification um, algorithm. But for more complex um, policies, they would be running a Plunk. Or supersonic. Yeah, as well as a, a, a supersonic version of Plunk. <laughs> But would that be like one set of? I guess this is this is actually where I'm I'm curious because you talked about like different deployments of the system. Would it be that one set of validators will run one set one type, or could you have one set of validators able to run many? Well, it's a very interesting question that we uh, you know we're uh, debating on the engineering side. Um, could you leave it as a configuration parameter? What version of the proof systems this, the, the system decides to run. So uh, we decided that the validators, we would choose what proof systems they recognize and what they run. Be or at least it, 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 right now it's fixed and we could leave it as a configuration parameter in the future so that if you deploy a different version of the system, the validators will run one specific proof system for the, you know, for the built-in transaction types. But you're you're right that that uh, we could leave it more of a parameter so that the user could choose what kind of uh, proof system they want to use for a policy. If we allow users to choose different types of proof systems, then we have to make sure that the consequences of that choice affect only the user and uh, the other parties who are uh, connected to this user and not the system as a whole. But for now, it's simple, right? We we ch we choose specific things. Nice. That actually, that's, that's really, this is, you know, in a way tied together a lot of what we just talked about. So I, I appreciate you like taking that kind of <laughs> slightly simplistic question or slightly like, uh, I don't even know, I don't want to say dumb question, but like. It's not dumb at all. I had clearly like not followed something. <laughs> it's not dumb at all. No. Um, thanks for taking that question. That actually really helps to clear it up. Uh, is the code open source? The code is not open source yet. We, of course, uh, plan to open source a substantial amount of the code eventually, but um, right now the code is not open source. There are a few components that we will open source sooner than others, such as uh, our implementation and improvements of uh, the dark polynomial commitment system hooked up to, uh, to Planck, which we actually call Darker, and also another side project that has to do with uh, transparent key management. And uh, so th those will be open sourced, you know, uh, sooner than the sooner than the rest of the system. What what made you make that choice to keep it a little bit more closed for now? Well, it it was a discussion among the various people in the company. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of it's very interesting to to, to understand the the trade offs between these two different models of running a company. I think that the background of most people is from more traditional software development and the, the inclination is to keep things uh, closed source um, and then, you know, retain the option of deciding when, to, when and what to release later. 
um, when needed. So maybe since we're near the end of the episode, maybe you can just like tell us a couple highlights of what's going on with Findora and what's coming up. Yeah, great. So um, a couple of our major milestones from from uh, from the last year was uh, the release of our supersonic system, which we um, which we talked about, and that will eventually be open sourced. We closed our first round of uh, funding led by Polychain Capital in December 2019. And in just this past month, or well in June, we announced our partnership with Tencent Cloud to, uh, to offer a product that will be hosted in Tencent Cloud. And what's uh, upcoming is our release of a testnet in August 2020. So that's the, the, the newest upcoming thing. And we're excited to have, um, you know, partners and, and developers look at that and play around with it. And we're really ramping up our, our hiring. So we're really interested in having, um, you know, interested uh, developers come join our project. Can people validate on your system? We will have a, a, a select set of validators for the testnet. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if people are interested in participating in... Uh, you know, in, in future iterations of our public uh, consensus deployment of the system, then stay tuned for more information on that. And you can find all of the relevant information uh, just on findora.org. And uh, I think that's a great way to reach out to us. If someone is interested in being a validator, you can put them in, in touch with me and we can, you know, and it's good to know about those cool. people, so. All right, well, thank you both for, for coming back on the show and for sharing with us all of the work you've been up to and giving us a little bit of insight into Findora. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>